Good afternoon. Welcome to the New Scholars Program of the Bibliographical Society of America. My name is Barbara Heritage, and I serve as the chair of the New Scholars Program Committee, and I am very excited to bring three new scholars to you today. This is going to be a great session, and so thank you for joining us here in person as well as online. We are live streaming, so we have a wider audience abroad, which is great. The New Scholars Program seeks to promote the work of scholars who are new to the field of bibliography, broadly defined to include any research that deals with the creation, production, publication, distribution, reception, transmission, and subsequent history of textual artifacts, manuscript, print, or digital from clay and stone to laptops and iPads. Yes, we do. We really do. <laughs> Each year, three new scholars are present um, here at the Society's annual meeting to share their current unpublished research in the field of bibliography, broadly conceived. In keeping with the values of the Society, the committee welcomes bibliographical scholarship pursuing new methods and new approaches, including applications from candidates applying bibliographical theory and principles to diverse materials in media. In addition, the committee welcomes scholarly submissions that embrace diverse, multicultural perspectives. The program is open to junior, that is untenured, faculty members and graduate students at the dissertation level and to professional librarians, members of the book trade and book collectors who are new to bibliography. If you are an early career scholar who is new to bibliography, I encourage you to apply. Or if you know people who would be interested in applying to the program, please bring this opportunity to this uh, this opportunity to their attention. It's a really great program, and I think, <clears throat> as you can see, there are many former new scholars in the room, um, which is a testament to how the program has really enriched the society over the longer term. I would like to thank the members of this year's selection committee, Megan Constantinou, Cynthia Gibson, Kanohi Nishikawa, and Agnes Garek for their valuable expertise and uh, the work they did it in evaluating a very strong pool of applicants this year, and also for moderating a really great session of uh, virtual presentations given last week, um, which sparked really great, I would say, half-hour discussions for each paper. It was, it was fantastic. Um, our vice chair, Cynthia Gibson, who's sitting right here, um, deserves special thanks for her dedicated work in helping me lead the committee. Thank you, Cynthia. We for we're fortunate to have such a great team in place. Uh, the New Scholars Program is supported through the generosity of a number of contributors, two of whom are no longer with us. The first being uh, Mary Ann O'Brien Malkin. So BSA's Malkin New Scholar Award was established through a contribution in memory of Mary Ann O'Brien Malkin, who lived from 1913 to 2005 well known to many as a longtime contributor to antiquarian Bookman, A.B. Bookman's Weekly, Marianne was one of the foremost collectors of books on dance. And I'm looking at you, Mara. <laughs> the Malkin New Scholar Award is made to candidates working in the fields of the antiquarian book trade, dance, and or Americana. And we're gonna hear a great paper today on dance. So um, I think Marianne would really enjoy this if she were with us. Uh, BSA's Panzer New Scholar Award was created through a bequest by Catherine F. Panzer, who lived from 1930 to 2005. Catherine Panzer is well known to many as an outstanding bibliographer, best known for her work on the revised short title catalog printed in England, Scotland, the short title catalog of books printed in England, Scotland, and Ireland, and English books printed abroad, 1475 to 1640. The Panzer New Scholar Award is made to a new scholar working in the field of bibliography, with preference for descriptive bibliography, especially that of English imprints through 1640. We are deeply grateful to Patrick Olson of Patrick Olson Rare Books, and also to George Ong, for the support of the New Scholars Program. And we also appreciate the support of an anonymous donor whose contribution has helped us to gather New Scholars past and present in New York today and to build community among them. So thank you. We could not do this work without the support of those great donors. Please thank them right now. Thank you. <laughs> and 
And now I'd like to turn our attention to this year's awardees who are sitting right over here. We are delighted to welcome Seamus Dwyer, Mara Fraser, and Rochelle Groschman to BSA. Each of these presenters is new to bibliography and each, as you'll hear, is approaching bibliographical research in new and very exciting ways. Seamus Dwyer, this year's BSA New Scholar, is a six-year PhD candidate in English at Yale University. His research interests revolve around the literary affordances and cultural meanings of scripts and medieval literary manuscripts. He is presenting Bastard Hands, Medieval Commodities and Reading Medieval Manuscripts, a paper that delves into the origin of the use and practice of writing in so-called bastard script, and that conducts a reading of John Gower's Confessio Amantis, drawing on keen paleographical analysis as well as an interpretation into the poem's hybrid bilingual poetics. Mara Fraser, this year's Malkin New Scholar, is assistant professor and curator of dance at the Ohio State University Libraries, Thompson Special Collections, Lawrence Lee Theater Research Institute. Her research examines relationships between movement and text in practices of reading, writing, and performance, particularly in the history of 20th century dance notation. She has staged dance works uh, by a number of individuals from notation and reconstructed, and she's also reconstructed a mass movement choir by Albrecht Kunst. She has an MFA in dance directing and documentation and a BFA in dance from Ohio State. Her paper, The Dance Typewriter, IBM, The Lab of Notation Element in Women's Work in 1973, explores the development of the mechanized transcription of dance notation when IBM released a dance type ball for its Selectric typewriter. Uh, and so again, um, this is, it's wonderful to have a paper on dance after many years of not having work on dance um, here at the Society. And finally, Rochelle Grossman is a specialist in Yiddish literature and print culture. She is completing a PhD in comparative literature at Harvard University, where her dissertation focuses on post-war publishing in Poland and Latin America. She examines the production and global circulation of Yiddish books to understand tensions arriving between local and transnational print contexts. In addition, her research on the Yiddish Book Center's rare type and printing collection will be featured in their new core exhibit, Yiddish, a Global Culture. Recently, she was awarded Harvard's Philip Hofer Prize from the Houghton Rare Books Library for her own collection of Yiddish books printed in communist Poland. Her talk, which really draws together all of the interests I've just described today, is called Dirty Slugs and Flimsy Paper, What a Page Can Teach Us About Yiddish Printing and Post-War Poland. And I think the committee, uh, when they were looking at this work, thought, hey, if anyone is going to be into dirty slugs and know what that means, <laughs> it is BSA. So without further ado, um, we will now watch their presentations on the big screen. And I hope the gang at the back of the room will take it away. IBM released a Laban notation typing element for its popular Selectric typewriter in 1973 with the help of the Dance Notation Bureau. Though this dance typewriter never took off, we are going to look at what its development, public image, and function show us about women's work in dance notation. Laban notation is a graphic language for describing movement, first published in Germany in 1928 and then fleshed out in the following decades by notators around the world. Although also known in some places as kinetography Laban, Laban is a recognized language for movement analysis with applications in fields such as dance preservation, robotics, and anthropology, and implications for United States copyright law of dance. Symbols in Laban notation are placed on a vertical staff that is much like a music notation staff turned on its side. These indicate direction and in space and body parts, and then timing runs vertically up the page. The taller something is, the longer it takes. On the right, here is an example of a page of handwritten Laban notation created in 1969 by Tony and Travaya. It is written in pencil on staff page paper, which is eight pitch or eight square per inch graph paper with four pre-printed staves running up the page. The, the words on the page are written with an IBM selector typewriter 
Tony and Travaio was a big fan, but the symbols on this page are not, not the Laba notation symbols are not typewritten because this is from 1969 before the Laba notation type ball was released. This is a really short Laba notation score and it shows one dancer's part, but a longer score for a group dance would be more complex and it could be up to hundreds of pages of notation. And so what this means is that Laba notation takes a lot of symbols to write. As late leading notator Anne Hutchinson Guest has said, Laba notation is a long hand for movement and not a short hand. And what she meant by this is that Laba notation granularizes movement. It takes a moment of movement and breaks it out into where each body part is in space with multiple symbols across the staff. It doesn't roll off of the hand or the pen when handwriting, like word writing might, or like script word writing especially. It's not one row in, in typewriting, it's not going to be one row of alphabetical letters going across the page. The process of arriving at a clean score like the one shown here comes in several stages of drafts. First, notators analyze movement and they choose the best combinations of symbols to capture it in a translation process. They're working live in the studio with dancers or possibly off of moving image. And working this way, they would start by creating a draft score using lots of paper, probably lined paper like legal, a legal pad or notebook paper and much more simple constructions of the notation, um, a type of shorthand for themselves as they work. And then later, when they're not in the time sensitive um, rehearsal process, they add details. So they, in the process, they've fully embodied the movement. They've danced it in order to be able to break it down into its parts. They take this added detail and then they finally transcribe everything into a clean copy that has everything sketched out in exactly the precisely correct place on the page. The type ball's development and design started in 1966 and it was released in 1973. So this time period is over 250 years after the typewriter had transformed office life and eventually created the woman's role of typist as women were thought to be especially suited for typing um, with supposedly their delicate fingers and fine motor ability. This um, mid 60s is also the women's liberation and civil rights movement and it was a really good time for theatrical dance in the United States that had received an infusion of Cold War era cultural funding that advanced dance activity and built audiences. And the Dance Notation Bureau had grown from four women who founded it in 1940 into a fully formed ser service organization by the mid 1960s. They had a board, paid staff notators and copyists for the notation. And it was also, the Dance Notation Bureau was also reorganizing at this time at the urging of its board. And the IBM Selectric had just come on the scene in 1961. It, in general, was a great success. It made it possible to change out fonts and make corrections while typing really quickly. IBM had been and is, or has been a company that looked for collaborations in the arts and sciences and novel problems to solve. So this seemed like it could be an opportunity for the Dance Notation Bureau to upgrade the physical production of notation scores. Material production of Laba notation had historically been very laborious. Notators generally used pencil and readied their scores for duplication with more pencil or hand inking or wax stencils. They usually used graph paper. Um, they also used sometimes different formats that would free up their hands and free up their body for dancing while reading. So they used cutout symbols um, of cardboard that can be placed on the floor and rearranged and danced over and scrolls that you can see here in the picture on the wall behind the women that could be hung on the wall, freeing up the hands. Notators had been discussing how they could speed up the process of producing scores and teaching materials for decades and thought they might find a way to design a, a dedicated typewriter for dance. And they never, you know, they never did design a dedicated typewriter, but the selectric comes into this, into this story. The workers of the Dance Notation Bureau were at this time entirely women and remained almost entirely women. They often worked as volunteers and they worked for little pay. Here is a photograph of some of the women of the Dance Notation Bureau seated around the table, around their scores, and in front of their wall of scrolls. 
These American notators were instrumental in refining the system of Laban notation into the functioning one that it is today. And along the way, they developed and operated an impressive circulating library of hundreds of theatrical dance scores, folk dance scores, and volumes of teaching material. And all of this has become part of the archival record of the ephemeral art form of dance in the United States. So it's, it's quite important. These women were also simultaneously operating a service organization to promote and record the art form of dance. But their history, the history of Laba notation in the United States has been little written about. And is it possible that some of this neglect is because of, because of it being primarily a women's history and because dance is a feminized art form? The history of United States notators intersected with the history of typing in 1966, when Dance Notation Bureau board member Early Bell, who was at the time urging the Bureau to modernize and become more mainstream and businesslike, worked with dancer and notator Lucy Venable, who's here second from the right in the glasses, and with Earl Crow from IBM to design a way to type Laba notation. What does the story of the Laba notation type ball tell us about the history of Laba notation and its women promoters? From a feminist perspective, I frame both the production of dance notation material texts and typing in 1966 to 1973 as types of women's work. That is work typically done by women that is regarded as a lower status than the work of men. How did this notion of women's work impact the way the ball was developed and perceived? I propose that the perception that the Lava Notation type ball was a tool for women's work marked the process of its design and marketing in several ways. I looked at what notators thought they were doing as shown from their internal correspondence with each other, and then what public image IBM, the Dance Notation Bureau, board, and the notators presented about the language, the system, and about the type ball, and how this public image differed from the internal concept. Where were gendered concepts of work inscribed or sub subverted here? First, we'll look at the function of the Selectric. The Laba Notation keyboard for the IBM Selectric placed lab Laba Notation symbols or their parts over the 88 keys of the typewriter, as shown here in the schematic on the right that went into the typewriter's manual, and you could make a copy of this and paste it right over the typewriter keys. So these symbols get placed over where letters and numbers would be, but Laba Notation is not alphabetical. Compared to the 88 options here on the typewriter keyboard, which is the 44 keys times two with the shift, there are somewhere between 500 to 1,000 Laba notation symbols possible. And that's not even considering the range of resizing that's necessary for any symbol that can be lengthened to show a longer duration. So as a result, it required up to, um, or at least, it required at least 12 keystrokes to make one of the most basic Laba notation symbols a regular length forward walking step. Um, in addition to all those keystrokes, you needed backspacing adjustments of the role and handwriting after the fact. As Eva Elania wrote in her version of the manual that she wrote for the French audience and translated into English, quote, you must consider each sign as a word, starting from the principle that any auxiliary operation such as reverse motion use of the spacing bar and of the half spacing lever, roll lifting and lowering, et cetera, are part of this word. So that forward stepping symbol, if it's a regular duration forward step, needed all of those other actions as you typed a word. It's a choreography of typing that's um, a bit more complex than typing a word that's a sequence of letters and then a space. And Laba notation symbols aren't words. You're essentially composing these symbols with the keys. So this is a more complex process than typing words. And furthermore, dance is not verbal. Nothing in dance corresponds directly with words. Dance is body movement in space and time. So we're trying to capture space and time in symbol through typewriter keys. This is a lot of translation. Furthermore, the left to right orientation of typing English words didn't ma match the vertical orientation of Laba notation. So a typist had to mentally rotate 90 degrees the whole time they worked. I suggest that there is a conceptual disconnect between Laba notation as it's written and typing words that no one quite reckoned with in the original 
part of this design process in 1966. This is a logocentric assumption that body movement is somehow subject to or dependent upon, or at least corresponding to in syntax verbal language, um, when, when really they're entirely different. Notators, like the ones shown here, Lucy Venable and Muriel Topaz, were experts and artisans in writing Lama notation and creating material texts of notation. And they realized this early in the process. They realized this first. Um, so the process, again, the design started in 1966. It stalled in 1968 when Lucy Venable left the Dance Notation Bureau to come to Ohio State to join the faculty in Ohio. In 1970, a few years after the project stalled out, Lucy wrote to Muriel Topaz, another expert notator, and she was asking, Muriel Topaz had been asking, should I continue this project? Venable was somewhat discouraging. She wrote, if we stick to the system, meaning the lava notation system, without modifications, then I do not know how much time will be saved. She cited reasons like the ones that I just mentioned about how the typing would actually be cumbersome. And she, she basically was acknowledging to Muriel Topaz, this typewriter is not going to make things more efficient. At the same time, she didn't fully discourage Topaz from continuing, but for other reasons. She also wrote one of the original reasons, idea, sorry, one of the original ideas for typing a score was to feed a tape into a computer where the information could be stored, recalled, or used in other ways upon demand. Venable's thinking had leapt over typewriting to designing a, to away from designing a material production solution and towards thinking about what else Laba notation could do if it could only be tied to an input. It seems that grappling with this input of the keyboard really got Venable thinking about the possibilities of computing with movement. And this type of forward thinking is really in line with the, with the way notators thought about what they were doing. They sometimes presented themselves or described their work as being a scribe of Laba notation or a scribe of dance, but they were really historians, they were theorists, and they were writing dance of the 20th century and thinking about what the information in dances mean. The Dance Notation Bureau did pick the process back up. There were some delays, but the ball was released in 1973 and it was offered for $18. As far as we know, none of the balls were sold. But the marketing shows some different strategies for how uh, how the balls, the type ball for dance, the value was narrated to the public and what how people described its importance or its usefulness. IBM's marketing on the left associates the type ball with a beautiful, slight female ballet dancer who's sitting behind the electric with her legs crossed. And um, she really is giving off fem feminine appeal. It's a lot like an automobile ad with a model on the hood or like other IBM ads at the time that objectified the secretary as a lovely lady of the office. Her crossed legs are, um, recall the crossed legs of a secretary underneath the desk. She needs to be demure and ladylike. And in fact, this ad reduces dancing womanhood and presents her as decoration. On the right, the Dance Notation Bureau made an informational one-pager that associates the type ball with the type of analysis of movement that Venable was thinking about. It interestingly draws on three non-dance activities, sailing, football, and horse racing, pointing to the idea that the notation had broad applications in movement analysis. However, it also completely disassociates lab notation from its history with women and dance. It doesn't show anyone notating or using a typewriter um, who would probably have been a woman because these are who populated the Dance Notation Bureau. And it also obscures notators' knowledge that dance had always, or that lab notation had always been capable of analyzing all sorts of movement. The typewriter did not make that possible. It just made a way to type those things. So in different ways, these presentations of the type ball's public image are strategic. They reflect what the organizations consider to be marketable about the type ball. And because dance and typing were seen as women's work, the accepted marketing strategy was through the women as a decorative object or through aligning the project with masculinized movement and distancing it from women, women's work. A few publications for teaching purposes did use the type ball to make short one measure items that could be placed on a page with typewritten word text. 
And the copy was nice and clear for those, but no full scores, 100 pages of, of notation were ever produced with the type ball. And strangely, though, even into the 1970s, the Dense Notation Bureau's board members, who were not themselves notators, touted the fact of the ball's existence in the press, claiming that it had sped up notation production. But the type ball never saved time. Notators continued and continue today to produce their initial scores by hand. Um, now there's computing solutions, and notators like Lucy Venable went, went on to explore what computing solutions were possible with notation. Thus, the lab of notation type ball's history suggests a disconnect between the value notators put on their own work and a lesser value assigned to their work by the public. To notators, they were materially recording a library of dances with their pencils on paper as they were simultaneously building, testing, teaching, and working out a textual practice for movement. However, in their public image, they were doing clerical work, women's work, the work of the secretary. I can't say this disconnect between public image and private conception is why the typewriter was a commercial failure, but there is enough dissonance here that it matters. It's an important story to those who love dance as an art form and a site of knowledge, but also to anyone concerned about how anti-woman sentiment might block innovation and the production of knowledge. The history of the lab notation type ball matters for those looking for ways to understand women's role in the production of material texts of dance. Thank you. Hi, so today um, I want to look at Yiddish literature in post-war Poland, and I want to focus on the materiality of some, some of the documents that were produced in this time period right after the Holocaust, so that we can think about the ways in which materiality can be a window into thinking about cultural reconstruction and the ways in which different actors, different figures are sort of negotiating political and social conditions in order to create a new body of material that can start to compensate for things like cultural loss, but also to map a future for a new idea about what Jewish life could look like in Europe after the war. So structure the conversation. I want to think about how in the immediate post-war years, there are a lot of people and things moving in and out of Poland. This is the very poorest time where refugees, Jewish refugees who had spent the war years in the Soviet Union, return to Poland. Some people who are in Poland leave Poland, um, going often to Germany to displaced persons camps from which they continued on to other places. And how this period is also characterized by a lot of foreign aid coming into Poland. Um, especially in the Jewish sphere, thinking of organizations that are trying to do reconstruction and aid work. So this is um, the very immediate post-war context, followed by a period of centralization, both politically and socially, as the communist government takes hold after 1947, and especially by 1949. And finally, I want to look at the Stalinist years, the sort of period of kind of intense centralization of the Jewish cultural sphere and the ways in which this also, um, on one hand, seems like a closing of this porousness, but how we can see through different document evidence that actually there was still a way in which different exchanges between East and West were possible, even during the Cold War, in regards especially to Yiddish literature. So to begin, really, I want to position us in Warsaw in 1945. This picture on the left here is of the former Jewish quarter, which was completely destroyed, very much leveled by the Nazis. And the condition of Jewish life in Poland is mirrored in the condition of Jewish books. So Rachel Auerbach, who is a cultural activist, a historian herself, she writes about this encounter she has with the city and with the, the spaces, with the culture, with, with everything that she's viewing. And she writes about how, in the case of Jewish books, tens of thousands of volumes of the collected works of the classics once wandered throughout the state of Poland, but are now scattered. Today, after long and hard searching, we may perhaps collect at most two or three sets. 
Only on the garbage dumps of small towns are there sometimes soiled, rain-soaked pages, side by side with the damaged pages of sacred books. And so in thinking about the way that Rachel Auerbach characterizes these books, there's a real parallel being made between Jewish bodies, Jewish books, the way in which the lack of Jewish books is also a reminder of this recent, very violent past. And the books themselves have been desecrated, have been scattered, much like people. And sort of completing this image is the way in which David Spard, another cultural activist who we'll hear from a few times today, he talks about his work in creating Yiddish literature in this context, that for him, Yiddish literature was akin to meeting the need for food, for a home, that, quote, steps were immediately taken to meet a spiritual thirst for the Yiddish word. So that these are the two kind of um, beginning moments here in which Yiddish literature is uh, an issue that is being immediately addressed right after liberation. So... Today, we're going to look at some of these efforts from a material perspective, as I mentioned, at the intersection of printing technology and of politics, both global and inside of Poland. So to frame this even more so in this material sense, I just want to point out the ways in which technologies of the time were very physical. So this here is um, on the left, an example of hand setting a movable type. On the right are cases of Yiddish type that were used to publish um, newspapers. And these type cases are extremely heavy and they're very physical. And somebody has to put each individual letter together to create a line of type. And I mention this so that when we look at this newspaper, Dosnaya Leben, New Life, which was the first Yiddish newspaper published in liberated Poland, we can think about the ways in which labor is deeply entwined with the creation of these new publications. And so this is an example of a handset newspaper. And I want to zoom in here to look at these two columns, because even though these two columns are right next to one another on the front page of this paper, we can really see some interesting differences between them that demonstrate much more of the conditions of cultural creation at this time. So if we zoom in and we focus on one single kind of letter, this is the Lamed, the L letter in Hebrew and in Yiddish. You can see that on the right, the Lamed has a sort of curled top. And on the left, the Lamed is straight up. And these are, between the two columns, they're different, but within the columns themselves, they're very consistent, which demonstrates that these are two different cases of type that two different typesetters are putting together. Maybe they're standing next to each other in the same print shop, but these inconsistencies demonstrate that there is a lack of, of, of enough type of one kind that can be used effectively to make this single newspaper. And not only that, if you look at some of the other examples of this very same letter, this top, which is either curly or straight, is in most cases broken off entirely. And this is because the way that the lamed is above the line, it is susceptible to breaking off if the type itself is overused. If the individual sort um, is used quite a bit, it can be susceptible to damage. So this shows us that not only is there a mixed use of type from different sources, but also the type itself is broken, it's old, it's being used um, as much as it can be. And this is specifically interesting because in 1946, the International Workers' Organization, the Communist Organization, and in particular the Jewish section, they write to the heads of the Sinai Leben with an offer that they are going to send a linotype to Poland along with the matrices needed to create a newspaper, to create the lines of type that they can use. And this is revolutionary because one machine can replace the labor of around six hand setters, which makes it cheaper, makes it easier to create more frequent issues of newspapers. It also frees up the type itself so that the newspaper 
can be made with the linotype can come out more frequently, and that the people who would normally have been setting each individual letter for the newspaper can focus on making new kinds of publications. And if we see, this is a later issue of Disney 11, we can see that this is a linotype set version, and the type is clearer, crisper, and um, no broken lamids, but we can see if we zoom way close, <laughs> zoom in, you can see that there are different extraneous marks in between many of the letters, which demonstrates that a lot of these slugs, these little metal pieces that the linotype makes, many of them were dirty, which is to say they had extraneous pieces of metal that were the inside of the of the matrices of the molds, which demonstrates that these Linotype, um, the linotype was really used quite a bit and not properly maintained. So even though this enabled there to be much more print material to be created, it also was another thing that was in short supply. Now, as I mentioned, having a linotype enabled the press to create new materials. So starting in 1947, Dos Nye issued books for the first time. And these are two of the very first books issued by Dosna 11, which in their own ways demonstrates particular mandates of the press and of cultural figures at the time. On the left is the book Ghetto Kingdom. This is one of the very, very first examples of what we now understand to be called Holocaust literature. It's a collection of short stories about Jewish life in the war in the excuse me in the Woods ghetto. And this book was in part created because of this initiative to remember and to sort of create authentic but also aesthetic testimony that recalled the experiences of Jews during the Holocaust. Now on the right by Leib Olitsky is a book, Man Will Be Good. This is a book of um, parables, little stories mostly for children with the idea that this book would represent the other attitude of the press, which was that the mission is not only to recall the experiences that had just happened, but also to build a new Poland and a new Jewish Poland in particular, so that people could rebuild their lives and think about something new. So these are the two um, pillars of the this press in 1947. And these books themselves, they're made on really bad paper, full of lignin, ground wood, very ephemeral in their actual qualities. And this is another demonstration of the ways in which shortages are also on display in the print material of the time. In thinking about this context, we can also start to wonder, given that there was such a shortage of physical materials of printing, a type of a linotype, of people who could set things, who and what gets published in this context? And as Dovid Svard comments here in his memoir about the time, he, he accurately mentions this idea that all writers possess a thirst to be printed, but ultimately not everybody has the merit to be printed. And in this context especially, those who were printed were often socially and politically connected to those in charge. And from 1947, increasingly, this meant people who were communist, officially communist in their political outlook and their affiliation, and also connected to the Yiddish-speaking, Yiddish activist communists who were placed at the head of the state-supported Yiddish press. And so Dovid Svard being chief among them. And this led to a kind of self-censorship insofar as many of the materials that were published in the early 50s to the mid 50s, certainly the time of high Stalinism, were ideologically mandated. As we see in the book here on the right, in Land of Racial Discrimination from 1953, there were materials that were anti-American in their outlook, as well as materials that were trying to connect the Yiddish book press, which became this new unified, centralized single press, 
they were trying to put this press on the global map that connected it to other presses worldwide in the Yiddish sense. On the left, for example, is a book by Yitzhak Turk of Grudberg. And the Turko family was very well known uh, for their participation in the Yiddish theater and how that stretched in a transnational way to different contexts in the Americas, in Israel, and elsewhere. And so publishing him as well at this time was also a way in which the press was demonstrating its active engagement with these networks. And we can also see the visual language that's being communicated here with these very beautiful covers created by the same illustrator, Itzik Reisman. Now, given that in the 50s, we have a lot of political incidents happening in which Cold War politics are really starting to solidify, and especially to solidify boundaries between the East and the West, it is all the more so surprising that the Yiddish book press, the Yiddish press in Poland, is, continues to have communication with and also active participation with organizations, for example, in New York. So this is a magazine from the ECUF, which is a Jewish communist organization. This particular branch is in New York. And their entire issue here, the back cover has this huge amount of space dedicated to promoting the works of the Yiddish press in Poland. And they are selling the Yiddish book uh, publications to their own readers in the West. So this is a way in which, even though officially exchanges between East and West are not sanctioned, there are ways in which these books are reaching a global audience beyond the Eastern Bloc. And it's not only in one direction, but we see here in this letter from 1950 that the editors of the Yiddish book press request books from ECUF in New York, ECUF's own publications, books that they themselves are not able to produce that they do not have, so that they can have these for their personal libraries, but also as source material for their own new publications. And just in our last few minutes, I wanna show a little comparison between some of these books. So the books on the right are from New York. These are from ECUF. The books on the left are the same books in terms of their material, um, the content really, but they are produced by Poland, uh, by the Yiddish book press in Poland in Warsaw. And so the significance of these books in particular is also very important because this is the collected works of Mendele, Mendele Moichersforum, who's considered the grandfather of Yiddish literature. And for those in this young press in Poland, this was a huge honor to be able to publish this work because of the ways in which this would solidify their press as participating in this ongoing chain of Yiddish cultural creation. We see the books on the right, they're hardback, they're austere, they're um, very serious. Whereas the books on the left, they are made out of uh, cardboard covers. The, again, the visual language is more in keeping with that of the other um, publications in the press. And the illustrator is the same, actually, of these as those that I previously showed. And this is also an interesting thing in thinking about how they were created. So in the opening pages of the books and the publication information, on the right, the ECUF mentions very explicitly that these books were financed by donors, in this case, donors from Mexico City, who has de have dedicated this particular volume to the memory of their parents. Whereas the book on the left from Poland is financed by the government, there's no need for philanthropy to create these kinds of materials. And yet, there is a big difference in thinking about what it means to be a cultural activist. Those on the right, these financiers from Mexico, they're explicitly named here as cultural activists for their participation by giving money. Whereas those on the left, the books on the left rather, the editors are named of course, um, and the bureaucracy and the different aspects of getting paper, getting materials to create these books is mentioned in a legalistic kind of way, but the actual material labor that 
enabled this book to be created is not mentioned. And to be honest, also in the example on the right, the typesetters, those kinds of individual actors are also left unnamed. So this sort of leaves us with a question about what it takes to create culture and to create, recreate, or develop something in the wake of something so catastrophic as genocide and how on one hand a diaspora comes to fill that void and work together with refugees to think about creating new things um, and also the ways that the local and global politics are also intertwined in these efforts. So thank you very much and I look forward to speaking further during our question session. Thank you. Paleography has a vivid vocabulary. The Latinate exacting terms which catalog the scripts of pre-modern and certainly medieval manuscripts comprise the heart of the discipline's tools. These terms offer not just a sophisticated taxonomy, but also a shorthand for the potential functions and cultural roles a script might have historically played. For instance, the script term textualis implies liturgy, formality, and authority, while another, secretary, indicates bureaucracy, utility, and facility. What these terms reveal about medieval perceptions of the handwriting they label, however, is less straightforward. It is important to acknowledge that a modern paleographical term is not the same as the medieval description, though they may appear identical. What did the wealthy widow Joanna de Walkingham mean when she bequeathed a certain book written in Litera Anglicana in her 1346 will? We may never know. But we cannot assume that she was referring to the same Anglicana that M.B. Parks coined in 1969 for a swathe of visually related scripts used to copy late medieval texts in England. Paying attention to the gap between medieval and modern perceptions of scripts allows for medieval meanings, often buried under modern connotations, to enrichingly add to understandings of historical handwriting. Despite its re routine use in paleographical discourse, bastard is a jarring word to describe scripts. This adjective was used by medieval writing masters throughout Europe to label a range of scripts, most notably the Lux Lettre Bâtard, or Bastard Secretary script of the later 1400s. Almost a century ago, Hilary Jenkinson commented that, in essence, medieval bastard scripts are a cross or compromise between two other well-known styles. The word compromise is telling here, as if the two scripts are somehow in conflict or not typically aligned. In explaining the term's usage, modern paleography tends to focus on the hybridizing of low and high forms that open themselves up to striking social analogies. Returning to Parks and Anglicana, let's consider his understanding of what bastard Anglicana is. This epithet refers to the display script that adapted Anglicana formata with the decorative features of textualis. In explaining his terminology, Parks writes, quote, a bastard hand is essentially the product of a union between base and between a base script and a noble one. Between a cursive script, the informal handwriting of the documents at the bottom of the hierarchy, and textura, the display script at the top, unquote. He supports this with a footnote citing an abecedarium from 1552 that defines bastard as begotten between base and gentle. Parks's definition is rooted in a pre-modern notion of classed intermingling. The Middle English noun bastard also held this connotation. John Trevise's translation of Randolph Higdon's Polychronicon describes the Persian king Darius Notus as, quote, a bastard or he that is a get of a worthy father and a bore of an unworthy mother. It is noteworthy that the idea of illegitimacy is tacitly implied at most, and by no means explicitly at the forefront of Trevisa's definition. What he wishes to emphasize is that bastard signifies a union from two distinct social ranks. It is the dictionaries that tend to accentuate a sense of illegitimacy in their definitions. The Oxford English and Middle English dictionaries, the Dictionary of Medieval Latin from British sources, and the Anglo-Norman Dictionary all agree that bastard, in both medieval and modern usage, denotes something that is adulterated, inferior, or somehow not genuine. But I'm curious about how invested the medieval term bastard was in these connotations that make the expression so jarring to modern ears. 
The moralistic suggestions that hang vaporously over its modern usage imply a condemnatory tone, a sense perhaps that medieval readers and writers saw bastard scripts as impure or not genuine, and that paleographers now maintain an inherited technical term while wryly reenacting a quaint moralism. But did people in the Middle Ages use the term this way or understand it this way? A mid 15th century writing master called Robertus de Tours, whose pattern book survives in the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, showcases Lettres Bâtardes alongside two other related scripts, which he calls Lettres de Minute and Lettres Curiales. Here, on the top of folio 28 recto, we see a rubricated heading signaling which script Robertus is modeling, Lettres Bastard in this case. The text snippet below is from the Vulgate's translation of Psalm 148, Laudate Dominum de Celis. Bastard letter, as modeled by Robertus, is an ornate script based on cursive letter forms such as looped D, single compartment A, and open tailed G. These graphemes are elevated by calligraphic movements of the pen that carefully applied decorative features, like spiky little horns on E and word final S, or the dark shading of F and long S as seen on the folio's final line. The richness of the script is further complemented by Robertus's inclusion of lavish, often painted cadles in initials and selected top line ascenders. The combination of low letter forms with higher ornamentation seems to mark what is bastard here. But hybridity is only part of it. Robertus's other two script categories imply that he viewed lettre batacte as a kind of middle road. His Lettre de Minute, which can be seen on the next leaf at folio 29 verso, shares many of the same features as the Bastard, except it is smaller, tighter, and slightly less ornate. Meanwhile, his Lettre Curiel, seen here on folio 30 recto, is larger, more embellished, and engrossing than the Bastard. Note in particular the decorative crook on the looped ascender of D, as in Venerandum on the top line. All three of these scripts exhibit varied combinations of low and high features. It is the bastard that occupies a position right in the middle between smaller and bigger, plainer and fancier. Robertus' samples of lettre bastard indicate that as a medieval script term, bastard occupies an aesthetically balanced middle ground. Strikingly, it is also unburdened by a subtext of adulteration or impurity. Further context shows that the term bastard was applied not only to scripts, but also to many other late medieval prestige commodities in English, French, and Latin sources. A history of the term used in this way not only provides a perspective for script as a product, but also gives a clearer view of the middle way bastard objects occupied in medieval production and consumption. Take saddles, for instance. Bastard gilded saddles are mentioned in an exchequer account roll from 1419, and the Parliament Rolls of 1423 mention a bastard saddle covered with crimson and velvet studded with gilt silver. These both seem to be rich objects, and so their bastard nature might express emerging of two types of saddle, or perhaps they are bastard because they signal emerging of two distinct classes of material, low leather and high velvet and high silver, for instance. Whatever its specifics, the term seems to refer to sim a simple hybridity in design and making rather than a description of something that is cheapened. Bastard wine was a form of sweetened spiced wine originating from southern France and Spain. An early 14th century Hiberno-French translation and adaptation of the Secreta Secretorum describes one variety from La Rochelle. Bastard wine of La Rochelle is strong and dry and sweet in flavor and very keenly harsh on the head and body when drunk in excess, but it causes a good release from the stomach, for which reason physicians say that one ought to drink it when going to bed. A full survey of this wine's drawbacks and benefits is given. It is strong, it delivers a walloping hangover, but it also has health benefits when consumed in moderation. Its bastard quality may well come from this dualistic characterization as both an indulgent libation and a medicinal treatment. It might also be bastard because sweeteners and spices have been added to it. Either way, processes of mixing for mixed purposes define this type of wine. This begins to suggest a sense that bastard refers to medieval procedures of mixing for instrumental purposes. Objects must become intermingled with other objects in order to achieve specific utilitarian aims. Medieval culinary texts offer a deeper view into the implications of bastard as a reference to processes of production. 
The 15th century Middle English cookbook preserved in British library Harley MS 279 mentions gravies, creams, sausage, sauces, and pottages as having bastard alternatives. Take for instance the oysters and gravy bastard, which follow the regular oysters and gravy. The bastard version uses many of the same ingredients, like ginger, sugar, and saffron. It even adds uh, ground pepper and salt. What seems to make it bastard is its simplified process. The regular recipe is fussier, involving several stages of parboiling and then a final boiling of all the ingredients together. The bastard version involves making a simpler gravy with the oyster brine, some ale, and water, and allowing it to boil with the spices before adding the raw mollusks at the end. Mm. Another pair of recipes makes this even more explicit. Viande de Cypris Bastard occurs just before Viande de Cypris Real, a sort of medieval meatloaf. As with the oysters and gravy, both recipes consist of more or less the same ingredients, including egg yolks, ground capon, and chicken meat with rich spices like ginger and saffron. But again, the bastard recipe is less elaborate, involving lower heat and less straining. The real version, in contrast, calls for an involved syrup to be made from spiced honey, raisins, broth, and wine to be drizzled over the meat. This gastronomical language uses some of the most explicit terms of human social hierarchy available to medieval English, bastard and royal, to pinpoint not quality per se, but rather the efficiency and time required to produce a finished product. A bastard dish is not necessarily worse, just less time consuming to whip up. All of this ultimately shows that the descriptor bastard, while distilling the language of problematic propagation, also designates a purposeful intermingling of efficiency with refinement in the making of medieval commodities. This enriches a sense of what it meant for medieval readers and writers to describe script as bastard. A bastard script, assuming it functioned like these other products, would have been seen as a category of writing defined by a compromise between care and facility. A bastard script forges a product whose tempered production modifies beautiful scripts to make them easier to write, rather than debases them in a cheapened imitation. My interests in the cultural meanings behind medieval idioms of script, like bastard, have broader implications for medieval literature. What can bastard scripts tell us about the literary text they preserve in manuscript? How can literature help expand our categories of script? I offer some initial answers to these questions by turning to John Gower's behemoth bilingual poem, Confessio Amantis, or The Confession of the Lover. At first, this text might seem a strange place to explore bastard literary or paleographical aesthetics. The word bastard does not occur in any form or language in the poem's 33,000 lines. But the poem's formal principles interlace Latin and English verse forms which guide the reader through a prologue and eight books in two distinct registers. Gower famously describes his goals for this hybrid structure in the Confessio's prologue. Worrying that reading a text that is too serious or too full of wise writings might dulleth oft a man's wit, Gower proposes to go the middle way, compositionally speaking, between lust and lore, so that his reader might like what he writes. Go the middle way. Gower envisions his confessio to be a negotiation between instruction and pleasure, wisdom and enjoyment. In other words, it is a compromise between high and low forms, a bastard poem. Lingering on bastard aesthetics as being integral to the confessio's literary program, we can begin to explore how poetic and paleographic principles can be seen to mirror each other, and indeed how poetry can help expand the potentials for what bastard scripts can be. This is an image of the opening folio of Cambridge St. John's College MSB 12, which I'll refer to hereafter as J, one of the nearly 50 extant manuscripts of the Confessio. J is unusual among the fairly uniform Confessio manuscripts produced before 1450. It is smaller than average and, with the scribal dialect located to northern Herefordshire, provides a rare example of a Confessio manuscript potentially produced outside of London. Moreover, it has a distinctive script. This next image shows more clearly Jay's lack of stiff, knobbly letter forms and its loopingly hooked ascenders on H, L, and B, features of Anglicana, which give an impression of a cursive hand. But Jay's script is infused with textualis in many respects. An upright vertical quality to the letters and a lack of splay is present. Set semi-rotunda minimum feet are discernible in M and N. 
ligaturing techniques typical of textualis are apparent here as well, such as the biting between D and various vowels, such as day in line 9, as well as kind and hond in line 11 and dawn in line 13. Other textualis features used in J include G and E with a protruding tongue. Additionally, several decorative features suggest a painstaking, almost obsessive quality. Minuscule D has an unlooped ascender in textualis fashion, but is without exception ticked with a small dash at the top of the ascender. There is no obvious purpose for these OTOs dashes other than embellishment. The J scribe also employs a sharp crook on the center ascender of W, making the letter more involved and branched in its appearance. The script of J's confessio is a finicky one that combines graphemes and decorative techniques from cursive and textualis in a unique mode. While this script little resembles the Lettre Batarde of Robertus de Tours, or even samples of Parks's Bastard Anglicana, I think it can still be described as bastard due to its careful process of refining cursive graphemes with calligraphic traits. Jay's bastard script participates dynamically in the bastard project of Gower's poetry. Consider what the lines say alongside what the script looks like. Here is the English text transcribed starting at line four. It stands not in my sufficiency, so great things to encompass, but I must let it overpass and treat it upon other things. Therefore, the style of my writings from this day forth, I think, change and speak of things not so strange, which every kind hath upon hand and whereupon the world must stand and hath done since it began and shall while there is any man. And that is love of which I mean to treat as after shall be seen. These lines from the opening of book one reiterate Gower's middle way, his bastard poetic suitable for reflecting on the ethics of love, his main subject. The narrator, Amans, must abandon great things so that he might speak of things not so strange. The Middle English word strange designates not just the unfamiliar, but also over embellishment, an object so overwrought that its meaning is obscured. The ticks, dashes, and fiddly nature of Jay's bastard script might actually seem to be working against Gower's poetic thesis, making his English visually strange, even as it seeks a plainness of meaning. Except it doesn't. The script of Jay retains a measured legibility through its bastard quality, unlike a script that is wholly cursive or wholly calligraphic. Jay's is not in danger of being too fluid or too dense, both of which might make it illegible. Its measured intermingling of different visual qualities yield a text that is not so strange, but perhaps just strange enough to give a reader a new way into the poetry, a middle way, a bastard way. Turning a critical eye to the terms medieval language used to describe handwriting yields nuanced potential for how these texts were made and culturally perceived as objects, how they were read, and how we might continue to gain new understandings of them. Thank you. I have received uh, a word from Aaron McGurl. We can run till 3.30. There is a break, so if you do need to step out, feel free, but the Q&A um, will run a little longer. Um, and I'm going to first thank everyone for those terrific papers. Those were wonderful. I know we just clapped. <laughs> and open up the conversation with a question. And um, and uh, there are more questions that I have. But if you have a question yourself, please do raise your hand, um, because we do want this to be a lively conversation. And as you all know, this is work in progress. And I think um, everyone welcomes the dialogue around their research. So just to open the question session up, um, I would like to pose this um, query for the panel. Bibliography, as we all know, offers powerful methods for studying and apprehending the material aspects of textual artifacts. So briefly, how did you first come to perform research with textual artifacts? And how did you first learn about the artifacts described in your present work? Were there any particular challenges you encountered in studying these materials? And um, uh, let's just start here with uh, Rochelle. Oh, thank you, thank you, and thanks to everybody for being here. Um, it's, it's an interesting phenomenon with Yiddish literature that do do a lot of initiatives from 
uh, institutes around the world, there is an enormous body of this work that has been digitized over the past 20 years. And I'd say that the majority of my initial engagement with this literature was with the uh, digitized versions mm -hmm. of it. But because what I'm interested in um, is this literature from this specific period, from parts of the world that are, in a lot of ways, uh, not well studied, a lot of my work brought me to different archives, and this kind of uh, literary engagement with archival material was a moment of encounter that then later, when I could hold the actual books that I had seen so often in PDF form, that was for me a real uh, aha moment that these books, even though on my computer they all looked very similar, they were all very flattened, of course, um, in person they're so different. Um, the, Ghetto Kingdom is such a great example because I remember um, I wrote quite a bit about this during the first months of the pandemic, writing that chapter. And it wasn't until months later I was at um, somebody's personal library and they happened to have this book and it is so small mm -hmm. that I couldn't believe it. This was such an important story that added so much to our understanding of the material that the stories in themselves are very moving. But the actual story of how the book came into being is also important in thinking about what the stories are really trying to say. So that's part of the journey that I will leave it to my colleagues here to add more. OK, thank you. Um, I was a trained dancer. And as part of that training, had to study dance notation hmm. and got injured and went farther with dance notation than I would have. That brought me into working in special collections and processing collections on dance notation. And I had um, unformed, intuitive sense of questions coming up handling materials that I couldn't articulate and that I didn't, I don't experience being asked in the dance studies or dance notation communities. And um, those just, gestated for a long time. And when I returned to those collections many years later as a curator, we had two of the type balls that I had heard of. Mm. And um, so then I think coming across bibliography that I didn't really know anything about before gave me ways to ask some of the questions that were more intuitive by looking at materials. So a, a method mm. that, or a, um, yeah, I guess a way of going about asking those questions. and. Um, the challenge I would say for me in this project was partially just, I still have logistical challenges to using these particular type balls. They're, they are, there's only two that I know of and they're in our collection, so I'm reluctant to get them dirty. And then there's, um, <laughs> there's a specific platen that had to be changed out and put on that typewriter that I haven't figured out yet. And then just studying anything through the lens of failure and means that there's not a lot of texts to look right. at. Yeah. So thank you. Yes. Yeah. Shameless. Um, for me, uh, this might be a heresy to say in a room full of bibliographers, but I'm very bad at detail. Um, <laughs> and so one of the few things that I found um, excited a sense of detail was script, was medieval handwriting. And um, at the Beinecke at Yale, where I'm doing my PhD, there's a, there's a manuscript of John Gower's Confessio, shocker, um, that has uh, a, a, a sequence of French poems um, by him also compiled at the end, where there's a script shift uh, um, from Anglicana to secretary, uh, which I, which on one level seemed kind of obvious in a way, like a, an English script for an English text and a French script for a French text. But um, it also didn't seem that obvious at all. There seemed to be sort of deeper questions to ask. And Barbara Shaler was my Virgil, um, helping me sort of um, wander the corridors of this book, um, which is an amazing book. It's also um, very smelly. It has uh, <laughs> a past a past of a, a, an interesting mold issue that's been solved. But um, anyway, so we, we explored it and, and thinking about it. And it's sort of become my kind of uh, my talisman in a lot of ways for um, interrogating questions that might seem to have simple answers, but I think, you know, sort of getting into the cultural gaps that might make those answers more complicated. Um, so, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Other questions from the floor? Yes. So, Laura, I, I guess I'm now obsessed with this idea of expression rendered into print and then completely abandoned because it didn't work. And I wonder if you encountered any other, um, I guess, endeavor similar to that, where somebody has tried to put into into print a, a notation of any sort of language or expression that then would just left to die as it didn't pan out. 
There have been many systems of dance notation that have arisen and then fallen out of use along with the dance style that they accompany. So that mm -hmm. seems like the closest to me. And um, as far as the ways they were produced materially, I, I don't know. I think it's a great question that I would love to look into more. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I noticed one of your first slides is it's a handwritten notation. Is that a how about? And so I was super curious about that because it seems different from the kind of studio dance that you talk about later with the notation. So I was just curious if that's part of the story or how that kind of fits into the, the story about the temporary. That is another line of inquiry into the history of Laban notation that um, I'm really interested in is in what ways did Laban notation really accompany a Europeanist approach to concert dance and um, in what ways did it facilitate a certain kind of approach to indigenous dance forms and traditional dances. Tony Intravaya was trained in Europeanist modern dance and but was approached by the, um, they were calling themselves the Plains Indians that approached her to notate that. And um, there's not a lot of context about it. And I think that is problematic. And so I'm, I'm really curious about that particular score and that situation. We, we have some of her papers, so I think that's worth looking into. Thank you. John. So while we're still on dance notation, before we move to other topics, I'm John Waltel from the Boston Athenaeum. Um, First, uh, Marianne Malkin would have enjoyed that immensely. You would have loved to, to talk with her. And I'm sorry she couldn't be here for this. Um, but uh, just as a, a point of curiosity, the, the, the uh, closest analogy I can think of to what you're looking at are, are you know, the development, development of the music typewriter, and uh, which has a more linear, you know, what, what it's trying to record is somewhat more linear than what the, 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 the vertical, the verticality of, of law notation is ama amazing. Um, but it, it just made me wonder, you know, I, I know nothing about dance notation except for having thumbed through the bibliography of Marianne's uh, dance collection and, and seeing the sort of the, the early modern notation with the the feet on, you know, representations of feet on the floor and, and twists and turns. and um, But it, it sort of made me wonder how law of notation is read compared to how, um, like, 18th century music scores were read. Do you, do you bring certain knowledges or preconceptions to the reading of it in the way that a, a, a performer of a, a a few by Bach would know to bring the grace notes in, which wouldn't necessarily have been notated um, in, in the period we notate it now, but, but wouldn't have been then. Yes. Um, there's a lot there. I, I so wish I could have met Marianne Malkin, O'Brien Malkin as well, and I heard a lot of good stories about her from my mentor, Nina Couch, um, and I'm I'm really interested in looking more into her collection. I think another parallel um, bit of technology might be the um, the Chinese typewriter, except even more character, many more characters. But that idea of a composite character, like a composite notation symbol, seems related. And then compared to musical notation, the big challenge is space, as I understand it. Mm -hmm. um, so time is there, but. But space doesn't have to be in musical notation, right? And um, earlier Laba notation was much simpler. And it, it's only, it's less than 100 years old. But the earlier was simpler than today. And the system was developed by these, these women and their colleagues to get all the, um, get detail in more. But to um, read a notation text is to, um, to study different versions and to study styles and to make your inferences in that way and then stage the most authoritative version of a dance that you can. Oh. More questions from the floor. Uh, Molly. Yeah, I'm Molly Schwartzberg from the Bowdoin Library, the judge of this year's paper. <laughs> <laughs> Prize. Um, my question is for Rochelle. Um, I was really interested in the political nature of the funding of these publications, and I was wondering 
whether you also see anti-communist um, support for publications um, at the same time um, from the U.S. and, well, presumably the U.S., and of course that can't get into Poland, but are there other diasporic communities um, publishing, and um, is it all, does it all feel deeply politicized uh, when you go back and look at the, the body of, of work? Mm -hmm. um, I'm just fascinated by, by that question. Yeah, so a, a parallel and sort of companion piece to this work about Poland is my work about Argentina. And in Argentina at the same time, there are some very large uh, series efforts that are put together by uh, the Polish, Jewish, Yiddish diaspora that um, is, is there and they are using their connections in the United States and eventually in Israel and France, just all over, mostly the West though, to create their own, in some ways competing version of some of the very same materials. And they're also within the Argentinian context, within the Yiddish context, they are also, um, there is an ECUF branch. These communists are also in Argentina. They also all know each other. They also have rivalries. So there's also the, it's, it's very political, but it's also very personal because everybody is uh, at least one degree of separation. Um, so that's happening as well as um, real, sort of competition over the legacy of certain important historical moments. So the um, anniversary of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is a very loaded year, that's 1953. And there are publications from every, everyone who wants to write in Yiddish thinks are coming out and they wanna claim different aspects of this moment for their own, um, we might say national agenda, although national not really in the sense of American, Argentinian necessarily, Polish, although in some ways definitely this. And in the Zionist sphere, even though Yiddish is not uh, well received, there are also Yiddish uh, writers and, and cultural activists there who are getting state funding for their own projects. In some ways that's also a competing project not explicitly against communism or anything like that, but this is also part of the whole arena that's happening at the same time. Yeah. Agnieszka, you had a question. I have a question for Rachel. Uh, and uh, I was wondering uh, how these books circulated uh, between the Soviet Union and the Soviet Union. Because it's very interesting to me that in the so this is um, a wonderful question and something that I feel that I was um, really privileged to see in kind of a firsthand way. Last year, I worked at the Yiddish Book Center and one of my um, sort of extra responsibilities was to manage incoming donations, which came from all over the world. People would contact the center and say, I have all these books from my parents or my community or I don't know, I, I just don't want them anymore. So they would come to the center from all over the world. We got a lot from Australia last year. So anyway, just to say that it's sort of the coda from this, that from first they were put out and now they're coming back to a central place. How they were circulated is a bit of a complicated matter because until 1956, where there was this political thaw, a lot of the communications between Poland and a lot of the non-Soviet sphere were limited, as I mentioned. But we see as in this example that there were sort of partners in the West that were taking on the, the buying and selling of these books. And they were frequently writing to them. There's a letter that I didn't show, but it's one to um, Ikuf in Argentina saying, dear Ikuf, you owe us 90,000 Swati for all the books we've sent you. Please get that to us. By the way, would you like more books? Because we'd love for you to sell them. And so there was, you know, in some ways kind of a, a nod to a market in a global sense, but really because probably they were not beholden to any kind of uh, financial obligations in a major way. Um, their major agenda was actually to put this material out there. And so circulation was important in a different way. Fabulous. Another question, and I'm going to repeat the question into the microphone because, because we have some um, people listening in via live stream that are having trouble. So if you, but if you can, speak up very loudly. <laughs> Peter. Seamus, I'm Peter Hatt from Berkeley, and I want to know if you've mastered a bastard hand. 
<laughs> the question uh, is whether Seamus is mastered a pastured hen. <laughs> I'm a lefty, so that would be like it would it would just all go to hell. I should though. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, question over here. Um, I have a question for Seamus. I, I really love the way your labor origins to think about the creative agency of scribes, and it's kind of interest not in the intentions of authors, but of scribes. And I just wondered if that um, carries through the rest of the project, whether you're kind of making a case for scribes as kind of authors. The question is if um, Seamus is making a case for scribes as authors and asking about the agency aspect of his project. Yeah, thank you very much, Eve. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm really interested in intention and what, like, you know, also the limits of scribal intention in some ways too, and like craftsmanship, is craftsmanship authorial intention or are these things purely coincidences? Mm -hmm. I think the kind of balance between pragmatics and interpretation, it's a really interesting one and it's a really fine one. And I think part of what thrills me about a lot of this is that it could just be pure coincidence, um, the way these things kind of come together. And so, um, yeah, I think, and there's a lot of interesting work out there right now on scribal authorship as as a kind of al alternative authorship. Um, and I think I'm, I'm trying to kind of enter that conversation in a, in a mode of, of thinking about how, how like, like sort of the limits of, of, you know, intention in some ways and how the visualities of letters kind of do work independently of like, of like um, human forethought in some ways. Um, but thank you, that's a great question. And we're just gonna conclude with one last question for the whole group. Um, so down the road, what are some of, the, some of the areas you wanna continue to explore as part of your research? And do you think, um, that there are areas for bibliography and book history to expand in some of these future paths that you're going to be working in? Goodness. Um, yes. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think becoming more interested in bibliography has really opened up a lot of new avenues for this research and also for my um, teaching. I think something that is a challenge with Yiddish, especially with the particular text that I focus on, um, is that many of these things have not been translated. Yeah. And so it's a problem for teaching because um, students, even if they are students of Yiddish, they might not have a very high level of language competency. But everybody can approach a material text from its materiality. And this, I think, is a really great opportunity to engage students um, and a general public and other scholars outside of the field, all of these things, in starting to understand some of these bigger concepts and the challenges facing this particular literature alongside um, a history of technology because Yiddish literature really developed um, at the end of the 19th century and then through the 50s, 60s, 70s. So this is um, right kind of the heyday of pre-digital printing and the technologies affected what could be printed, who could be printed, uh, who was doing the labor of it all. And yet a lot of this history is unknown because it was so ubiquitous that nobody thought to write it down. And so these are also interesting avenues that I'm curious about, especially as they relate to this particular corpus, but I think they ask bigger questions that are worth uh, interrogating. Thank you. Uh, I'm interested in asking similar questions of other texts, um, other materials in Laban notation first. Um, this was just one tiny moment in Laban notation, and I'm really looking at the American history of Laban notation, 1940 to 1980. Um, that also I would love to extend into other descriptions and documentations of dance, and I loved your question the other night, Barbara, to me about that and um, other time periods. I wonder, being really new to bibliography and still learning what the literature is, um, I wonder if the frameworks of movement analysis that I'm more trained in could, um, could shed light on embodiment in production of print materials or production of books. Um, so that looking at that physicality through a lens of notation or movement analysis. Um, I'm also, you know, just right now, just on one tiny moment, too. And so uh, I, I'm curious about looking at other periods, um, other moments in the Middle Ages. You know, and it's only a millennium, so whatever. But, you know, um, <laughs> we're thinking about where other moments and where, you know, how script is working in, in other kind of moments in medieval history and how they may or may not compare or contrast with 15th century 
um, modes. And um, more broadly, just, I mean, you know, as bibliographers and book historians, we have amazing terms. We have amazing technical language. And I'm, you know, just turning a critical eye to that language and looking at it from behind mm-hmm. in some ways mm-hmm. and thinking about why we use these words, why these words have meaning, why they carry on, why they... Um, you know, what kind of, you know, baggage do they shed? What kind of baggage do they retain? Um, just thinking about that for the long durée. But, yeah. Thank you. I hope you'll all agree that the New Scholars Program is a wonderful way to introduce new and fresh perspectives to BSA. I think we've seen that today. Uh, please join me in honoring Michael Winship, who is here, and Roger Stoddard, who may be here, for their forward thinking in creating this program in the 1990s. And once again, in remembering Marianne Malkin and Catherine Panzer, and also thanking our generous sponsors, Patrick Olson Rare Books, Georgia Ong, and our anonymous donor, who've made this program possible through their generosity. Thank you.